thank you very much for the introduction and a special thanks for inviting me to this conference. Uh, I've never been here, so um, I have the feeling I might have the only talk about trapped ions. Um, that's why I will keep it a bit superficial. Don't worry, I will not go into all technical details. So, yeah, as was already said, I'm from Braunschweig, and actually I was very impressed how long it takes to travel from Braunschweig to Sonthofen. It took me 10 hours yesterday. Um, and I'm also associated to the Leibniz University of Hanover, where I'm teaching, and I'm full professor there. Well, this is our group in Braunschweig. You find us at the premises of the National Metrology Institute. Uh, we're located in Maria Göppert Meyerbau. This is my team. We're roughly 28 people right now. And uh, yeah, the name of our team is Quantum Clocks and Complex Systems. Uh, at the same time, I'm also guest professor at Osaka University. That's why we always have a very nice exchange with Japan, with Tokyo and Osaka labs. Uh, during COVID, of course, it was a bit uh, slowing down for three years. So these are photos uh, from 2018, 19. And now this year, two guys from Osaka are coming again and the exchange is taking on again. Yeah, so this is a, a short overview of my group. Uh, we have uh, five teams, uh, and today I will mainly focus about the precision spectroscopy. But uh, since I don't know most of you here, and maybe you don't know me, so I will just also uh, give you a very short overview why we call it complex systems. So this has to do with our research on the dynamic of cooler crystals. And if you're interested to this, please talk to me maybe in the break. I just give you here a very short overview. Uh, this is our work on topological defects, phase transitions, kibbutz Zurich scaling, everything that you can do in a um, many body system with long range interactions. We're very interested in this dynamics and we have been also studying nano frictions on an atomistic scale and energy transport and also bringing it into the quantum regime. But this would be a full 45 minute talk, so I have to pick and be careful. Um, also the integrated iron traps, I will not go in detail. Again, if you're interested, please talk to me. Um, so we're integrating nanophotonics uh, into our iron traps. We're uh, building basically quantum processors for the quantum computer, but also for scalable quantum metrology for the multi-ion clock I will show you today. So there we're collaborating uh, with Launix, Karan Meta, Infineon, and this is our dream, this is where we're heading at. So the lab on a pick on our photonic integrated circuits, so we have everything, including the lasers, on the nanoscale. But now I come to the physics part. Uh, so this is what I was chosen today for, the precision spectroscopy in cooler crystals. So how can we use these cooler crystals for quantum metrology? Why multi-ion clocks? What is a multi-ion clock? Actually, nobody has a multi-ion clock, and I just want to give you a bit of a motivation how I started working on multi-ion clocks, how I came up with this idea. Actually, after my master, PhD, and postdoc, I, I, so far I always had worked with neutral atoms from francium, rubidium, and magnesium. Very late, I switched to ions. Um, and as was said in the introduction, I had been working on quantum sensors, gravimeters, accelerometers, so I was very interested in geodesy. And uh, what excited me about the idea with when you build a clock is that you can actually measure heights with the help of clocks. If you have a clock which is only precise enough, let's say 10 to minus 18, yeah, 18 digits after the dot, then you can discriminate height differences of the level of one centimeter. So in our lab, we really have to level the height of the ions with millimeter precision so that we know if our clock is correct, or if you're already measuring general relativity and the relativistic redshift. Yeah? So Einstein tells you the closer you are to the gravitational center, the slower is time. If you go away, if you lift up your, up your clock, the faster is time. Ultimately, if you go to a black hole, yeah, you hit the event of horizon, time freezes out and stops. And this is exactly the effect that we're measuring on a daily basis with our clocks in the lab. So the idea was, what happens if we bring our clocks up onto the mountains? Now we're close to the mountains, so I give you this nice example with the Zugspitze. Um, due to global warming, unfortunately, we know that uh, not only the glaciers, but also the permafrost is melting and diminishing. The Zugspitze is becoming unstable, and it's actually shrinking. 
So geodesists are thinking that the Zugspitze is probably shrinking by one or two centimeters per year. But nobody could measure it so far, because if you put a, a gravimeter on top of the mountain, you're very sensitive to local mass variations. The gravimeter senses the force, the acceleration, which scales with one over r squared. So you're very sensitive to the snow cover changing over the year, uh, the groundwater table, and all these things. And if you look at the table, like here on our, that was a review article about atomic clocks for geodesy. I don't worry about the numbers, but you, you will see the gravimeters just drowning into the fluctuations of local mass variations. However, if you put a clock up on a mountain, the clock measures the potential of the gravitational uh, potential. So, so the, yeah. <laughs> uh, and the potential, of course, goes with 1 over r. So the clock is only sensitive to long range mass changes, and in particular the height. So if the mountain is shrinking, you see this with the clock. So if you put the two sensors next to each other, you really get the full picture. And this is what we would love to do in the future, actually, on the Zugspitze. You have this Schneeferner House, an observatory, which is also connected with a fiber. Uh, it's also paid by LMU, Munich Universities, and many uh, other contributors in Bavaria. So that would be a lovely experiment to bring up our clock here. And another motivation I want to give you why relativistic geodesy, as we call this, is really important, is if you compare height data which are taken on the ground by uh, geodesists and you compare this with the data taken from satellite, like from the Grace and Gotje mission, uh, you see huge differences. This is on the level of plus uh, half a meter to more than minus half a meter. And you see this huge gradient from the north of uh, Scotland down to the south of uh, Sicily. And these are the mistakes, the errors that we're making when we're measuring heights on ground. And heights is basically, geodetic heights is telling you where does water flow. So it's also very important for hydrology. So what we're claiming is that clocks, atomic clocks in the future can serve as height references to really level worldwide and define a reference system of height system. For this, we need clocks at the resolution of 10 to minus 18, because this is uh, how the geoid, how the heights are unknown at the moment. So over the whole world, you have uncertainties at the level of half a meter. And if you're interested in this, uh, this was a, 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 yeah, a movie that we were taking during the lockdown time on Corona. So we had time together with Fermilab and NIST. It's all about time dilation, just a fun fact, but that's for the general public. Okay, so this is the motivation that drove me to build clocks at this level. And I switched to the ions. During my second postdoc and now in my, uh, my career of the last 10 years, I'm working with trapped ionized particles. And typically you trap ions, not with a magneto-optical trap and such things. No, you trap them in a very classical ion trap. You have some electrodes around the ion, and due to this very strong cooler interaction, you can trap them. If you Let's see if I can animate it again. Yeah. If you shake the potential, yeah, that was the Nobel Prize Wolfgang Paul received a long, long time ago. So you apply an alternating current here, so you shake the potential much faster than the ion can leave with a heavy inert mass, and then you trap it in such a ponderomotive time average potential. And what is really special about this ion traps is that if you do this, you get extremely deep trap. Depth. You have on the order of 10,000 of Kelvin. So even if you have a hit from a background particle at room temperature, you don't lose the ion. The lifetime of these ions is actually on the order of weeks to even months. You can have a PhD student working with only three ions in his or her PhD lifetime. So this is nice. Uh, they, the ions are trapped uh, in first order to electric field equals zero, so you don't have any first order systematic shifts. The ions have the world record in coherence time, as you know, also for quantum information. You have this very strong localization, very deep in the Lambdicke regime, so you can uh, basically even prepare the ion to the quantum mechanical ground state of this harmonic oscillator, of this trap, and it is really a perfect harmonic oscillator because it's so deep. And then in the end, uh, you're just limited by the quantum fluctuation, by the wave function itself, and that's on the order of 10 nanometers spread. So this is how well, you know the location of your ion, you can characterize it in terms of what are the electric field gradients, magnetic fields, and everything what the ion sees. And that's why you get this extreme high precision and accuracy. 
And on top of it, uh, the physics package, because everything is really trapped, you can shake it and bring it around, you can build it in a very compact and robust way. And I think that makes it very interesting for portable clocks. And last but not least, you focus to a few ions, so we're talking about microwatt of laser power. It's a really different regime you're, you're working with compared to neutrals. And yeah, having said, about, uh, talked about this high accuracy, well, the world record in the most accurate clock today is actually held by the iron clock. It's at the moment at the NIST, uh, just crossing the border to the 10 to minus 19 region. But that's a head-to-head -head race, so we're now uh, slowly pushing into the 10 to minus 19, but yeah, 9.5, 10 to minus 19. And this is the best accuracy at the moment observed on this planet. Well, uh, maybe uh, for sure most of you know Dave Weinland. He received the Nobel Prize for this already in 2012 for the groundbreaking experimental methods that allow to manipulate and measure single quantum systems. How to prepare the single ions in the quantum mechanical ground state, how to do laser spectroscopy and entangle the motional states and the spin states. All of this, which is the basis nowadays for quantum metrology, but also for quantum information. But we're still talking about a few single ions. And uh, actually, all clocks worldwide are operating with a single clock ion. Now, I talked a lot about accuracy. Let's talk about stability. What is stability? It's basically about the statistical error. When you do a measurement in quantum metrology or in any metrology, you, w uh, you do care about noise. So what are the temporal fluctuations of your system? How long do you have to measure until you can res really resolve your signal? And this is in metrology, we are, um, we are denominating this uh, with the term of Allen deviation, which is basically a statistical deviation, but a two-sample deviation, I will not go into detail here. Um, it, it, it's given like this, so basically if you have wide frequency noise, you average with 1 over the square root of tau, tau is your measurement time. Yeah? So you, if you want to improve your measurement by a factor of 10, you have to measure 100 times longer. Hmm? And this is now the typical current stability of optical iron clocks, and you see uh, within just a day you barely hit the 10 to minus 17 limit, and if you measure for tens of days or even 100 days, you hit the 10 to minus 18 level. So at the moment, we're not really limited by the systematic uncertainty and the accuracy. Clocks are limited by the stability. How long do you have to measure until you resolve your signal? And that's very important. The lasers need to stay in lock. The students have to stay awake. And you want to measure maybe some interesting signal at this time, uh, at this uh, time scales, maybe the tide or something uh, dynamically changing. So our mission when we started, when I switched from neutrals to ions, I was thinking, why do ions always have a single ion? This is naturally limiting your quantum projection uh, noise limit. It's limiting your shot noise limiting. And you cannot even dream about Heisenberg scaling because we are always stuck with a single ion. So this is where the multi-ion approach comes from. So when we started working with ions in 2010, um, I, I put up the challenge what do we need now? Experimental methods that allow us to manipulate and measure a many-body quantum system, not a single qu uh, quantum system. How can we scale up a single ion to a larger cooler crystal, to tens of ions, maybe one day hundreds and thousands of ions, keep the high level of control and accuracy, but also beat the quantum projection noise limit? Yeah, this is then the basis for improving your instability with n ions, but one day you can dream of entangling them and going to 1 over n scaling Heisenberg uh, limit, and you can dream of multi-ensemble clocks where you can even average with 1 over tau, so not with 1 over square root tau, but 1 over tau. This is what we proposed in 2012, and uh, what I mean with uh, scaling of 1 over tau is uh, I'm thinking of a cascaded clock. So in our ion traps, where we're trapping not only many ions, but also many ensembles of clocks, in every other segment, it's a scalable ion trap, similar to what you, know, what you see nowadays in quantum processors for the quantum computer. You can uh, think uh, that you are operating one ensemble as clock number one, and the other ensemble as clock number two, and so on, and you cascade it. So you have interrogation time uh, of tau one, 
and you read out the phase noise of the laser, you slave your laser onto the first clock, and then you cascade it down with a longer Ramsey interrogation time, and again a longer Ramsey interrogation time, and this scales with one over tau. And like this, you can start up with a rather simple laser and very quickly scale down to a very high resolution. This is what's called cascaded clock operation. But for this, you need something scalable. And yeah, in 2012, we had proposed this multi-ion clock, uh, and it's very hard, technically also really hard. So we worked for 10 years, and we see now many more groups all over this world are now following this approach. Uh, there's a group in Singapore, uh, the calcium ions, uh, the aluminum clock uh, at NIST is going multi-ion now. There's been a recent nice proposal of Dave Leibrand and Mariana Safranova from TIN2+. And also at PTB, the strontium clock is also becoming multi-ion. So this is now taking on speed. This is really a novel approach. And why? Why did people take so long? What is, uh, it looks so simple on a paper, right? <laughs> so what's the problem if you put many charged particles in an ion trap? First of all, well, you're still sitting at E equals zero. But the curvature of the potential, and respectively, that means the gradient of the E field is not zero any longer. Yeah? You have a gradient. And that means the ions are talking to each other. And how they interact is via the quadrupole moment of the electron shell. So every time when you don't have a perfectly uh, sphere-symmetric uh, electron shell, like a S equals zero potential, you do have a quadrupole moment and, and then a quadrupole shift because of the electric fields. And this quadrupole shift can be hundreds of hertz. So that would be 10 to the uh, 13, 10 to, 10 to the 14. So you have to find special candidates with a low quadrupole moment. And if you do the atomic calculations, you see that uh, very nice symmetric uh, shells are obtained in the aluminum, indium, uh, and even in the ytterbium ion, where you have the F state. This is a whole state very close to the nucleus. And you rip up an electron, bring it to an S. So you have a, a leftover hole in an F state, which is really close to the nucleus. and being a little bit like a Faraday cage because it's shielded by the electron cloud. So these are very uh, interesting candidates. In our group, we choose the two later ones. Why? Well, uh, we thought that indium is maybe the simple one, the simple candidate. Because if you want to try something new, you maybe don't aim at the uh, most difficult. So why is indium simple? I learned to appreciate a lot heavy masses. If you have a heavy atom, you have a small time dilation at a given heating rate, given micromotion, technical prop noise. Uh, the, the mass really helps you a lot in terms of time dilation shifts, which is at the moment the biggest problem in clocks. Indium has a very low black body radiation shift, so even at room temperature, the Planck spectrum interacting with the atom is shifting the energy levels only a little bit, 10 to minus 17. Other clocks have 10 to minus 15. This is 100 times more. So we're already talking about the level where our room temperature is destroying our clock measurement. Uh, the second order Seemann shift is by far the best by orders of magnitude. And in addition, it has a direct detectable transition. So if you're looking at the singlet and triplet system in indium, uh, in principle, that should be completely forbidden. But again, because indium is very heavy, uh, you have relativistic effects that are mixing the states. They're not pure eigenstates anymore. So you do get a finite lifetime here of 300 uh, kilohertz, roughly. And you can do direct detection and spectroscopy on this intercombination line. So you don't need a uh, quantum logic spectroscopy and scale it up to hundreds of ions. And this is our clock transition, which is a pure singlet S0 to triplet P0, very closed and symmetric. Um, we're cooling the indium ions via a terbium because it doesn't have a strong cooling transition. You know this is ugly, 159 nanometer. You don't want to build this laser uh, in vacuum. Uh, so we're doing sympathetic cooling with the terbium, but that helps us a lot because it levers us. We can do a lot of systematic studies in the terbium atom itself. And ytterbium is also nice. We are using it for other experiments, as you will see at the end of the talk. Ytterbium has three clock transitions. Two of them we're using, like a quadrupole transition and an octopole transition. So the F state, this is this F state I talked about, has a lifetime of 1.6 years. You can do wonderful long coherence experiments with it. It's extremely ultra forbidden. Well, um, this was about uh, atomic physics, but uh, as always, especially metrology, the big problems come in with technology. 
uh, and they are mainly trap related. So why did people not scale up things? Why do we not have a quantum computer with thousands of qubits, uh, logical qubits? It's the scalability problem. And it all is in the trap production. So uh, I will not go into the technicalities and I, I don't worry, I will not bore you. I just want to say we have developed many traps at PTB and I'm proud to say we have really uh, maybe the best and most accurate iron trap worldwide that is scalable, where we really can keep all the uh, systematic shifts at the 10 to minus 19 level. Um, recently, we have also started to collaborate with Infineon. They are producing also such uh, quantum processors in Villach in Austria. So I have three PhD students now working at Infineon. And we're going from simple scalability to also integrated nanophotonics, integrated detection, and really to push it to the limit. And these are the beautiful cooler crystals that you see in our ion traps. So you have two-dimensional, three-dimensional, and one-dimensional systems. In the long term, of course, you want to push it to three dimensions, but again, as a metrologist, I'm conservative, I'm sorry, we will start with one-dimensional systems because nobody had demonstrated that, so let's take on this challenge first. And the first thing that we had to do, because nobody believed us that it would work, uh, we had to measure really this time dilation shift inside such a Coulomb crystal, even a linear one. So how does time tick from atom to atom to atom? Every atom will feel a different time because of motion, motional shifts. So we measured this micro motion, atomically resolved. And I'm sorry, maybe we're doing a bad job in the graphical <laughs> figures, but this should be a three-dimensional plot. And you really see every atom in our cooler crystal. Um, this is the spatial coordinate. And this bar is a nanometer. So this is the motional amplitude that we can resolve at the nanometer level. And this is the micro motion, and you see this uh, 3D gradients we have here, and that corresponds to time dilation shifts at the level of 10 to minus 19. I mean, we did a very good job because in other traps you have this gradients affect a thousand times larger. So it sounds now boring because people worked very hard to push it to this 10 to minus 19 limit. But we know now we understand time dilation even atomically resolved over our Coulomb crystal. In 2019, we published the whole uncertainty budget of the whole system inside an iron trap. And it was the first time that anyone worldwide could show that we could trap such elongated, spatially extend cooler systems and have uncertainties at the level of 10 to minus 19. So that was really a benchmark. Thank you. But now we have to prove it because if you operate a clock, many other problems come in. <laughs> so we have now a dedicated setup uh, and, and problems I'm talking really about bad BNC cables, DDSs that are broken. So this is now the actual uh, clock that I show you here. For the clock, uh, what we need are first of all uh, very stable lasers. We built them ourselves at a 10 to minus 16 level. Everything's self-made. Then we trap this mixed species cooler systems. We, have, uh, we image them on a CCD camera uh, in both wavelengths at the same time. That's a bichromatic detection system together with a sphericon. We sort the ions so that we have optimal sympathetic cooling. That's all automatized. And in 2022, I just want to show you the latest results. We participated in an international clock measurement campaign against Paris and Torino in Italy. And uh, we first measured the indium versus strontium uh, uh, frequency ratio measurement, which was published 2020 by NICT. And our measurements were already two orders of magnitudes better than was published in 2020. Uh, locally at PTB, we even were able to average down now to the low 10 to minus, uh, 3 times 10 to minus 18, even 2 times 10 to minus 18 region. And that's really something. Most all other clocks in Europe didn't see that. That was really good because if you average down in a linear way without any flicker and no bump, then you know your systematics. If you have a shift, at least they're stable. And this is now the error budget that we have achieved uh, in terms of absolute uncertainty, 2 times 10 to minus 18, but that's limited also by unknown atomic parameters. The reproducibility is at the level of 6 times 10 to minus 19. So if you do the same measurement, how well can you control your systematics? And this is being pushed now to be scaled to more and more ions. These are the very first temptations, so the very first tries.